<laughs> Guess what? <laughs> I think he turned it off. I'm reaching. I'm reaching 80. Is it there? Oh, okay. Sorry. Well, your 80 and my dad's 80 are worlds apart. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, believe me, aging is a is a factor in life that I never anticipated, and it just kind of sneaks up on you when you're in the middle of the process, and so you learn day by day. I wanted to make mention of the fact that I asked Karen if she had a, a vial with, that we could use for oil, and she found that little one on the table right there, and uh, we are going to be positioning that on the communion table, and I asked that for a very specific reason. We have, down through the years, not done a real good job in praying for people who are sick and hurting. And, uh, and I think that's on us. Uh, I believe the scriptures are very, very clear as to what we should do when it comes to people who are sick. Uh, they are supposed to, by the direction of the Spirit and the conviction in their heart, they are supposed to call for the elders of the church. And we are to anoint them in, with oil in the name of the Lord and pray for them that they might be healed. And we know that there's a lot of questions in our day about healing and exactly, you know, how we should approach that. And I don't want to get into that. Uh, the reality is this, that God wants us to be obedient to him. And he wants us to practice this as a church. And we, we haven't done that faithfully. And I, that's, on, that's on me as a leader here. I've been in leadership for a long time in the church here. And most of my dealings with healing have been reactionary. Not always, but they have been. And the reason for that is because of the wide gamut of opinion and some of the extremes that have taken place in the evangelical world uh, with regards to that. But that is not a reason for us not to do this. We are asked by God to do that. And so I'll just remind you again that every time you see that vial, uh, if you want us as elders to pray for you, we can do that. We can do that even today after the service. Uh, we will gather, we will anoint you with oil, we will pray for you that God will heal you. And of course then the question always is, does God heal everyone you pray for? Well, absolutely he does. It may not be in this life, but every believer in Christ is going to be healed totally. And what we need to pray in faith, and that prayer of faith heals the sick. It's not the prayer that heals the sick, it is God by His Spirit touching the body that brings healing. And He does it sometimes in very miraculous ways. He does it sometimes very progressively. And sometimes His answer is no. And I think that's very clear in the Scriptures. But we need to practice that. And so, just, just a reminder. Well, today we're looking at a portion of scripture, and I kind of chuckled because in our Sunday school class, Kelsey used the very same scripture that I am going to be using today in the message. It's found in John chapter 20, verses 24 to 31. If you have a bulletin, it's before you on the back page of the bulletin. And I am going to read that, and uh, then we will pray and get into what God has for us. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and he stood in their midst, and he said, Peace be with you. And then he said, Thomas, reach here your finger and see my hands. Reach here your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet they believed. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, 
and that believing you may have life in his name. Father, we ask this morning that you would guide us by the Spirit as we look into the Scriptures. You've made it very clear to us, Father, that without the ministry of the Spirit in the hearts and minds of men and of your people, we are not going to be able to clearly understand what you're communicating to us through the Word. And so we trust you today through the Spirit's presence and through his presence in the hearts of those who know and love you, that you would open our minds to what you have to say to us and open our hearts to obedience. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, after much prayer and consideration, uh, I reached the conclusion that a focus on the Gospel of John would benefit us as a church body for the strengthening of our faith in Christ. And I've chosen to introduce this series beginning in chapter 20. And the reason being that in verses 30 and 31, as you have them before you, John gives us the clearest or one of the clearest statements of any biblical author regarding the purpose of his writing. I wrestled with this for quite some time. Well, how do you determine what God wants you to preach on? Um, I guess maybe some people get bells and whistles and voices and visions and dreams and now that's not me. Uh, I, that's never happened to me. It's never been that way with me and I'm not being critical of that. I'm not saying that that shouldn't be. That's just God has never directed me in that fashion. He directs other people that way and I think that's wonderful. And so I prayed, Lord, I, I really feel like this is what you want us to do, but I have no idea what whether I'm going in the right direction or not. I, I need some kind of a reassurance uh, that this is what you want us to do. And I came to Sunday school this morning and there it was right before me. Kelsey had chosen the exact portion of scripture that I printed in the bulletin, wondering if this is the direction God wanted us to go in. What, what a great confirmation so I'm anticipating this. I've never preached through one of the Gospels. I've never done that before. Uh, I have used them extensively in my preaching. Uh, you can't not use them uh, because they are so important with regards to the essence of our faith. So today we're going to begin uh, looking at the book of John, but we're going to look at the reason for John's writing it. He says there's a, actually a twofold purpose. Verse 30, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's the first reason, first purpose. And secondly, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, so that believing you may have life in his name. Now, the context of this is really, really important. Uh, the ten disciples uh, have finally come to an understanding. The ten, that's less Thomas. Thomas wasn't there. Uh, they came to an understanding of the necessity and the meaning of the death and resurrection of Jesus. They began to understand it. The Holy Spirit had opened their understanding. Remember in this portion just before, Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whoever sins you remit will be remitted. Whoever sins you retain will be retained. And I believe at that moment in time is what Luke referred to as the opening of their minds in that room. They were then capable by the Spirit ministering in them to begin to understand the the essence and the meaning of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He opened their understanding that his death was a ransom for our sin, and it was a propitiation for the wrath of God, a satisfaction, and his resurrection was the overcoming of death, and also the imparting of resurrection life into the hearts of those who believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Son of the living God. Now, they had met Christ. Thomas wasn't there. 
And so Thomas tells them, when they all excitedly tell him about what had happened in, in Jesus' appearance, makes this statement. He says, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and it wasn't just see. I don't just want to see it. I need to stick my finger, my finger in the nail hole. And I need to take my fist and I need to thrust it into his side. And if I can't do that, I will never believe that this Jesus has actually been resurrected. And then it says it was eight days later uh, when Jesus appeared. And Jesus gave him that invitation. Reach here with your finger. See my hands. And reach here with your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. And now John is writing to those who have not seen and who will not see as Thomas has. Uh, even though they have not seen, he says, these people still believe. And he's writing to all those that are coming after Thomas, including all of us who are gathered here today. We are not going to see the resurrected Christ as Thomas did. And yet believing as Thomas came to believe, we also can know life and know life in abundance. He says, but these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. In 1 Peter, Peter writes something very similar to what uh, John records here. In 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Very parallel thinking by Peter and John. Now we see through the words spoken by the apostles. I'm sorry, I have to re-emphasize that. We see now, again, we see here today through the words of the apostles in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 15 through 17. We read, And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. The reality is this, that though we do not see Jesus physically, and we can't touch him physically, we can see and we can know him, but we see and know him through that which is written. It's through the record, the infallible record of the scriptures, that we come to know him, even as Thomas did. I want to give you just a, a brief comparison of the Gospel of John with the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, there's a difference between how each of these writers approaches the story or the narrative of Jesus and his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. In Matthew, Matthew is writing to Jewish readers, that's pretty obvious, because he begins his uh, dialogue, he begins his narrative, I should say, with a Jewish genealogy, and you can read that. We don't do it here. Won't do it here today, but you can do that. Uh, he begins with this Jewish genealogy, beginning with Abraham, right down to Joseph, and to Jesus. And he does that because his purpose is declaring or presenting the Messiah to the Jewish people. Mark takes a little different approach in his gospel. Uh, Mark, if you read the Gospel of Mark, you will find that it's all about facts and action. Uh, immediately, immediately, immediately. That word is used over and over again by Mark. Uh, actually, when he begins his Gospel, he skips the birth of Jesus completely. And he begins with John the Baptist. And carries on from there, John the Baptist's ministry and then Jesus' ministry. He's probably writing to a, uh, to a Roman or a Greek uh, audience. And then Luke. Luke tells the full story of Jesus' life. He does it in consecutive order. He was a, you know, a, a physician, 
uh, very well educated. You can tell it when you read his book, his gospel. Uh, he begins with the birth of John the Baptist, then it's followed by the birth of Jesus and the life of Jesus uh, right through to his crucifixion. So he is telling about the entire life of Jesus. It's a full story of Jesus' life in consecutive order. That was his intention. He wanted it to be very, very clear that this is how things happen. But then you come to John, and John doesn't do any of that. <laughs> John's approach is completely different. John is dealing with the deity of Christ. Uh, he begins with the pre-existence of Christ in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. Apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life. The life was the light of man. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are dealing basically with the humanity of Jesus. And John is dealing basically with the deity of Jesus. That would be the distinction between the three synoptic Gospels and the Gospel of John. I found a little chart done by a man named Bruce Hurt is his name. He uh, is responsible for a website called Precept Austin, which I use very, very regularly. It's just a great site to use. But he talks about the portrait of Christ. <coughs> In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's the God-man, his humanity. But in John, it's the God-man, his deity. The perspective is a little different. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's a historical perspective. But in John, the perspective is spiritual. The discourse is different. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's more on the public discourse of Jesus. In John, you have a lot of the private discourse with Jesus, intimate communications with his disciples. The emphasis is different. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the emphasis is ethical and it's practical. It's what Jesus taught. But in John, and this is really clear in John, it's more of, on the person of Christ, who Jesus is. That's what he's focusing on. And the geographic focus in the ministry is different. Uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's mostly north in and around Galilee. But in John, it's mostly around Jerusalem at the time of the feast. It's a different, uh, just a different geographical uh, focus. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the feast, there's only one Passover that's recorded. But in John, there are three Passovers that are recorded. That, incidentally, is how we conclude, how most scholars conclude, that the time frame in Jesus' ministry is three years. It's through three Passovers. The key word in Matthew is fulfilled. The key word in Mark is immediately. The key word in Luke would be the Son of Man. But the key word in John is believe. In fact, you will find that the word believe is used just about, I think it's 98 times it's used in John. That is more than the combined usage in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So it's pretty clear that the emphasis in John is on believing. In Matthew, Christ is portrayed as a king. In Mark, Jesus is portrayed as a servant, and in Luke, Jesus is portrayed as the Son of Man. But in John, in John, Jesus is portrayed as the Son of God. Now, John encourages people to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and it's the stated purpose. The very thing that the disciples and Tom, uh, Thomas wrestled with, the very issue they were wrestling with, is the issue that John is addressing in his, uh, in his accounts. 
Jesus is who he claimed to be. That's what John is saying. He is the great I am. He is the Son of God. He is the one has, who has come to give us eternal life and life in abundance. And that life is for us right now. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity makes a statement that we've probably all heard before. But as I was preparing this, it came to my mind because this <coughs> resonated with me. Because this is exactly what John is doing in his gospel. He is pre presenting the reality of the deity of this man. And C.S. Lewis says this, I am trying here to prevent, this is in mere Christianity, he says, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him or about Jesus. I, this is what they say. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. And C.S. Lewis says this, that is the one thing that we cannot say or must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be either a lunatic on the level of, with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else he is a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us never come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us. He did not intend to. That is quite a famous quote, but it is very, very true. It is very, very perceptive. Now, John says that there is a connection between seeing and believing. He says that seeing does not necessarily save, but believing does. He says in verse 30, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now, what are the signs that he refers to, the signs that they had seen? There are seven of them that he mentions. I'll go over them just really quickly. We'll cover them as we work through John. He turned the water into wine. That's the first one he uses in chapter 2. The healing of the official son. That's in chapter 4. The healing of the paralytic. That's in chapter 5. The feeding of the 5,000, that's in chapter 6. The walking on water, that's also in chapter 6. The healing of the man born blind, that's in chapter 9. And the raising of Lazarus in chapter 11. And John says that seeing these signs, which prove that Jesus is the Son of God, does not save anyone. All it is is seeing. You're looking at the evidence. And all of these signs are recorded, he says, so that the readers will believe that Jesus, the Son of Mary, is the Son of God. And believing, when you do believe, you will have life in his name. And the, probably the one of the foremost portions of Scripture that we quote often from John is in chapter 10. Beginning at verse 7, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and they might have it abundantly. It is that abundant life that John wants these Christians and he's writing to believers in this book. It's that abundant life that he wants these people to experience. And it is inseparable from the nature of Christ. It is in his name, he says, that we experience that. That doesn't mean just repeating the name of Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's a statement that tells us it's found, this life is found in the divine 
nature of Christ. That's where abundant life comes from. He was totally man, but he was totally God. And as total God, as divine, he is able to impart to us through his death, burial, and resurrection, by his spirit, he is able to impart to us this uh, abundant life. David Holloway, I don't know the man, but he wrote a book, The Sovereign World, and he talks about the life of Jesus. I'm just going to read this to you. After six years given to the impartial investigation of Christianity as to its truth or falsity, I have come to the deliberate conclusion that Jesus Christ is the Messiah of the Jews, the Savior of the world, and my personal Savior. The author writes, these were the words of Lee Wallace, who was the governor of New Mexico over a century ago. He started out to write a book against Christ, and in the process he was converted to Christianity. And he told a friend how it happened. This is how it happened. He says, it had all, I had always been an agnostic and denied Christianity. Robert C. Ingersoll, a famous agnostic, was one of my most intimate friends. He once suggested, see here, Wallace, you are a learned man and a thinker. Why don't you gather material and write a book to prove the falsity concerning Jesus Christ? That no such man has ever lived, much less the author of the teachings found in the, in the New Testament. Such a book would make you famous. It would be a masterpiece in a way of putting an end to the foolishness about the so-called Christ. The thought made a deep impression on me, says, and we discussed the possibility of such a book. I went to Indianapolis, my home, and told my wife what I intended. And she was a member of the Methodist Church, and naturally, she didn't like my plan. But I decided to do it anyway, and I began to collect material in my days <coughs> here and in the old world. I gathered everything over that period of, in which Jesus Christ, according to the legend, should have lived. And several years were spent in this work. I had written nearly four chapters when it became clear to me that Jesus Christ was just as real a personality as Socrates, Plato, or Caesar. And the conviction became a certainty. I knew that Jesus Christ had lived because of the facts connected with the period in which he lived. It could be proven historically. I was in an uncomfortable position, he says. I had begun to write a book to prove that Jesus Christ had never lived on earth. And now I was face to face with the fact that he was just as historic a personage as Julius Caesar, Mark Anthony, Virgil, Dante, and a host of other men who had lived in olden days. And then I asked myself candidly, if he was a real person, and there was no doubt, was he not then also the Son of God and the Savior of the world? Gradually the consciousness grew that since Jesus Christ was a real person, he probably was the one who he claimed to be. And I fell on my knees to pray for the first time in my life. And I asked God to reveal himself to me, forgive my sins, and help me to become a follower of Christ. And towards morning, the light broke into my soul, and I went into my bedroom, woke my wife, told her that I had received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And she said, I have prayed for this ever since you told me your purpose to write this book, that you would find him while you wrote it. Lee Wallace did write a very famous book. It was a masterpiece and the crowning glory of his life's work. He changed, he changed the book he was originally writing and used all of his research to write another book. And now every time I watch the epic film made from that book and see Charlton Heston riding, racing those four magnificent white horses in that amazing chariot race, I wonder how many who have seen Ben-Hur with its moving references to Jesus no, it was written by a man who wanted to, do, to disprove that Jesus ever existed and instead became convinced that he was the greatest man who ever lived. That was news to me because I had never realized that. It's just 
a tidbit that I found in my, in my research. Well, I don't know where you're at this morning, where you're at in terms of faith and believing, but the Gospel of John was written for the specific purpose of bringing each of us to deep faith in Christ as the Messiah, the very Son of God. And in believing that He is who He is, John assures us that we will receive life through believing in His name. There's a lot of anemic Christianity, Christianity being propagated in our day. That ought not to be. The greatest power, I believe, that has been released in the history of mankind in this world is the power of the resurrection of Christ. <coughs> Thomas found it. It transformed him. He gave his life for it. It took a lot to convince him. <laughs> I can't imagine what that would have been like. It would have been very, very humiliating, very humbling for him to say, my Lord and my God. But he submitted to that. It transformed his life. And his life, along with the other apostles, impacted every facet of the world that we live in today. Well, do you know him? Have you submitted to him as the eternal Son of God? Have you placed your faith and your trust in him? If you do, you will know life and you will know it in abundance. Let's pray. Father, take these simple words and use them to strengthen our faith and our trust in our relationship with you. And help us, Father, as we begin to move through this great, great gospel to come into deeper appreciation for who Christ is in his deity and how that impacts us. We pray in Jesus' name.